Well, good morning, NCC family. It's good to be with you as always. Welcome family and welcome guests in the room as well. And for those of you joining us online, thank you for being here as well this morning. Our mission as a local body is to make much of Jesus every day to everyone. And that is our mission today. It's our mission in the songs that we have sung. It is our mission in the interactions that we share. And it is our missions in the scripture that we will teach this morning. In all of these things, we want to make much of Jesus. He is why we exist. He is why we do what we do as a local body. In short, it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. He is the solid ground on which we stand. And a few weeks ago, we finished the series called Solid Ground, where we looked at Matthew chapter 7. And in that series, we learned something. I hope you remember it. If you do, please say it with me. We learned that everything we build the houses of our hearts on, apart from the truth of Scripture and the person of Jesus Christ, will fail us. I know it's been a couple weeks. Don't forget that. Everything we build the houses of our hearts on, apart from the truth of Scripture, and the person of Jesus Christ will fail us. That's true not just for a series. That's true for life. We learned in that series a couple of things. We learned that our foundation matters. We learned that our individual households must fear the Lord, serve the Lord, put away false gods. That we must have a perspective of the world that comes through the lens of Scripture above all things. And that we learned that we must commit in our individual households to serve the Lord and to serve Him alone. Now why? Why did we take time a few weeks ago to walk through a series on solid ground and learning that the foundation we build on matters? Why did we do these things? Well, the first is that Jesus is worthy of our whole life devotion and worship regardless if we gain anything from it. He is worthy all on his own to receive worship and praise from us. Even if we received nothing, he is worthy. Secondly, to return to Jesus' parable in Matthew chapter 7, we see that a wise man built his house on solid ground, the truth of Scripture, the person and work of Jesus, and that his house stood firm when what happened? When rains came, when floods arose, when the storms of life knocked him down, his house stood firm. This is where we find Habakkuk. In the midst of storms that he can see ahead, storms that he knows are coming on the horizon, and he's trying to figure out, is my foundation sure? And that's a question that we all have to ask. Not trying to be too heavy as we begin, but when the storms of life come, not if, when sin rears its ugly head, when the wolf of destruction crouches at your door, when the enemy steals, kills, and destroys, when we face natural and unnatural disasters in our nation or in our world, when there is political unrest and instability, wars and rumors of wars, when emotional and relational tensions run high and they keep you awake at night due to divisions between yourself and your friends, when you lose your job. When a loved one passes away after a long battle with sickness, or when a loved one passes away suddenly, when your children walk away from the faith, or you feel like you might, when your spouse cheats, or when you cheat, when your basement floods, when the insurance won't cover it, when you get a diagnosis you prayed you would never get, When your child wakes up screaming with night terrors because of anxiety and pressures at school. When your son's addiction to pornography comes to light. When a beer with friends after work has turned into night after night of just one more and you wake up in the morning unsure of how you got where you got in your life. When your anxiety and depression hits so hard and so deep that your chest hurts and you can barely breathe. 
When the rains fall, when the winds blow and the floods rise, the man who built his house on solid ground, he stands firm. He stands firm because his house is built on the truth of Scripture and the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, truly, church, I don't know how anyone navigates life without the truth of the gospel. Because we've been through a number of scenarios that I named this morning, and they might fit your life. You might have different ones. But there have been moments where over the last few years, if not for the grace of God, if not for the love of Christ and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I know I would be lost. I would be hopeless. But church, we hold to these truths that God is our strength for today. He is our bright hope for tomorrow. He is faithful through every storm. He is bigger than every storm that we might face. These are the truths that we hold to, yes? And they are good, and they are true. But have you ever had a moment when the storm felt bigger? When you struggle to say, much less believe, the truth that we're holding to in this series, which is God is God and God is good no matter what. Because we say that, and we go, yeah, amen, God is God. He is good no matter what. Even though you have faith, have you ever had a day when it felt like the darkness would overtake you? Even though you know truth, you've had moments where you have felt faint, when lies spoke louder. Seasons in your life when sin so drenched you in hopelessness that you questioned, is God really great? Is he actually in control? Have you ever experienced a hurt so deep, been on a side of a divisive rift so wide that you questioned, God, are you truly glorious? Are you really gracious? A day when the solid ground on which you stand seemed a very bit like standing on the edge of the cliff in the midst of high winds. Like the psalmist in Psalm 13. Have you ever cried out like this? How long, Lord? How long will you continue to ignore me? How long will you pay no attention to me? How long must I worry and suffer in broad daylight? How long will my enemy gloat over me? Look at me. Answer me. Oh Lord my God, revive me or else I will die. This is God's word. This is King David writing poetry and song to God. What if we sang songs like that? That'd be a weird Sunday. <laughs> Have you been there? Are you there? If you have or if you are, it is my prayer that through the study of this book that you'll, re you'll realize this truth, that you are not alone. You are not alone. Because that tension and that desperation that we hear in the Psalms, that desperation and tension that you may face right now, is where we find Habakkuk. Let's look together. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Let's do this. If you are able, let's stand and we'll read this together. It'll be on the screens as well. Beginning in verse 1. This is the oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw. How long, Lord, must I cry for help, but you do not listen? I call out to you violence, but you do not deliver. Why do you force me to witness injustice? Why do you put up with wrongdoing? Destruction and violence confront me. Conflict is present and one must endure strife. For this reason, 
the law lacks power and justice is never carried out. Indeed, the wicked intimidate the innocent. For this reason, justice is perverted. Thank you. You may be seated. Most would agree that Habakkuk's exchange with God and the subsequent recording of it coincides, this is for all of you history nerds in the room, this coincides with the rise of the Babylonian Empire. This prophesies of and takes place between the Babylonian defeat of the Egyptians in the Battle of Carchemish at 605 BC and the rise of King Nebuchadnezzar at the first capture of Jerusalem in 597 BC. This is the same Nebuchadnezzar that we see with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, same guy, same timeline. And right out of the gate in this passage, we notice something really interesting. Where most prophetic writings start out announcing or proclaiming something in a monologue, Habakkuk brings us into his own internal struggles with God. His own cries to God. The tone is different than most prophetic writings. It sounds more like the Psalms of Lament, like one that we just read in Psalm 13, or like the writings of Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet. Habakkuk is allowed by God to complain. Habakkuk is allowed by God to complain. God allows him to come to him crying, accusing. Do you hear the tension in his voice? I mean, some of us, we grew up in traditions where if we said stuff like that out loud, people would go, you don't have faith in God. God allows Habakkuk to come to him with these tensions, with these complaints, these frustrations. Now, there are some theologians that would point to this exchange, and they would say that Habakkuk is an example of how to come without faith before God, and to just lay out our frustrations, our doubts, all this stuff, just to lay it out to him. That he comes to the table in a way like a child complaining about his older brother who punched him in the arm and stole his Pokemon cards. Dad, Dad, violence! Why do you see this and not do anything? Don't you care? And I must admit, on first reading, that's how I took this text. But the longer I sat in it, the less I believe that is true. This text is not an example of someone who is faithless coming to God. Habakkuk is full of faith. If he didn't have faith in God, he wouldn't go to him in the first place. If you didn't have faith, why go to the one that you don't have faith in? Habakkuk goes to God. He is not an insolent child complaining about his sibling. He is a servant of the Lord who is broken over the sin that he sees in the people of God. And even more, he is broken because what he sees in this brokenness is that he doesn't see his God stepping in to address sin in a way that he knows he normally would have. And so he's going to, God, why are you doing nothing? Look at verse 2. How long, Lord, must I cry for help? How long must I cry for help, but you don't listen? I call out to you violence, but you don't deliver. God allows Habakkuk to come to him with his complaints, his accusations, his questions, his concerns, as the prophet seeks to understand what God is doing, or rather from his insight, what God is seemingly not doing. He's coming to him with these concerns, these doubts. He's saying, God, what are you doing? Christian, doubt is not the absence of faith. Questions are not the antithesis of truth. Rather, they represent a desire to know truth more deeply. And so Habakkuk looks around at the world that he sees, a world that is overrun with sin and injustice, and his faith drives him to the one place that he knows he can find hope. To Yahweh. To God. 
Again, you may have grown up in a tradition or may have believed a lie for most of your life that we can't go to God like this. That we can't go to God with these frustrations, with these doubts. But we see that that is simply not true. As we see Habakkuk, as we look throughout the Psalms, we see Psalms of lament like Psalm 13 that we read earlier. But God allows us to come to him full of faith and full of doubt. And God meets us full of grace and full of truth. We come to the table. We say, God, I believe that you are God and that you are good no matter what. But I just don't understand what you are doing. I just don't get it. God, if there's any other way you could have done this, like, this, this is the thing that my family's going to walk through, God? This, this is the thing that we're going to deal with in our generation? This is the thing that we're going to deal with in our lifetime? This, we can come to God, saying, God, you are God, and you are good, and we can still have doubt. Does Habakkuk leave his concerns at the door? No. Does he put on a smiling face in his Sunday best and pretend he's okay with everything that's going on in the world? No. He doesn't. And neither should you. Neither should you. Look again at this verse. Verse 3. Why do you force me to witness injustice? Remember, this is an oracle that God is bringing Habakkuk into so that he can see what is coming. And God brings him into this space where he sees all of the sin that is right in front of him. Why do you force me to witness injustice? Why do you put up with wrongdoing? Destruction and violence confront me. This is very up-close language. This is not, hey, there's something happening far away from me and it's really sad and I don't know how to, how to handle it. God, would you just deal with that? This is in his face. Conflict is present. Anybody been there in the last couple years? And one must endure strife. See, Habakkuk's tension is one that many of us face. Habakkuk believes God is God, and he believes that God is good no matter what. He just wishes that God's goodness and God's sovereignty, or God's godness, if you will, would show up in a way that they currently are not. And so he sees the injustice and sin in the world, and he wonders, God, why are you not responding yet? And see, see, there have been moments for me, no doubt there have been some moments for you, when I've looked around at the American empire and I have wondered why God hasn't burned us to the ground. I've looked at the sin in our world and I have wondered why God doesn't judge us more severely. It's only by his mercy that he hasn't yet. But more than the sin in the world, I'm amazed that God hasn't wiped us off the map because of sin within the body of Christ. Among God's people, among, God's, among the Christians, we have a rampant disregard for the seriousness of sin. And that spits in the face of a Savior who died for every single sin that we embrace and are entertained by. And so we allow pride to lord itself, we allow our pride to lord itself over those who are not as far along in the faith. We believe that we are better than lost sinners. Church, we are lost sinners, if not for the cross and the empty grave. Every one of us, we are sinners dead in our transgressions and trespasses against God, enemies of God, but while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We are no better than the world, we are just forgiven. We have received grace and mercy. We are not better. The moment that you think your sin is not as bad as somebody else's, you have an improper view of sin. Habakkuk also sees this sin not just in the world, but in the people of Israel. In verse 4, he references this. He says, for, the reason, that for this reason, the law lacks power. 
and justice is never carried out. Indeed, the wicked intimidate the innocent. For this reason, justice is perverted. When Habakkuk speaks of the law lacking power, or your translation may read the law being paralyzed, he is speaking of the Torah, the law, and instruction that was received from God for how Israel was to worship him with every aspect of their lives. And so Habakkuk looks out at the people of God and he says the sin within us is so messed up that even the laws that God has given for us to live holy lives, it's not doing anything. People have such disregard for it that it may as well not even exist. It lacks power, it's paralyzed. In the ESV expository commentary in this passage, David Firth writes, Habakkuk is troubled that Israel's law appears powerless to address the problem that he sees. That which was meant to guarantee the application of God's justice seems powerless in the face of violence, with the righteous unable to overcome the wicked. It is this that leads to Habakkuk's cry to God for help. So God has caused Habakkuk to see the injustice, see the abuse of power, to see the intimidation of innocent people by wicked men, to see the sin among God's people, and Habakkuk can't bear it. He sees the sin in the body. He sees the sin in the people, and he can't handle it. God, don't you see this? Do you see what I see? Why do you not move? Again, Firth writes, Indeed, what particularly troubles the prophet is that God has caused him to look upon iniquity, while God himself appears untroubled to look upon oppression. So what will Habakkuk do? What will God do? Right? I mean, Habakkuk has come to him and he's laid all of this out before him. In a way, again, that for many of us, as we read this out loud, it makes us slightly uncomfortable. If we were to speak to God in this way, we would be uncomfortable. So what do they do? Well, we find out next week. I know that's terrible. But at the start of our time, We read Psalm 13, verses 1 through 3. A passage similar in heart to the words of Habakkuk. You probably saw some real similarities there. How long, Lord? How long? We see the desperate and difficult cries of King David as he wrestles in this moment with the sovereignty of God, the goodness of God. But at the end of Psalm 13... Look at how it reads in verses 4 through 6. Then my enemy will say, I have defeated him. Then my foes will rejoice because I am shaken. So David starts in a place of brokenness and defeat. And in that place of brokenness and defeat, this is what he says. But I trust in your faithfulness. May I rejoice because of your deliverance. I will sing praises to the Lord when he vindicates me. Wow. Doubt and faith. You know, aren't we quick to praise God when things are going the way we want them to? God's good. And he is. We're quick to praise when all is well in our worlds. We're quick to praise when our comforts are not toppled over. But we are far too guilty, I believe, of giving God attaboys for when we believe things are going right rather than worshiping him no matter what. While we may not say it with our lips, oftentimes our lives reflect it. We look around at the sin in our world and within our worlds, in our own households, and we push it under the rug because we tend to be satisfied with lesser things. 
See, one of the tensions that we face whenever we read a book like Habakkuk is we identify with the hero. We want to be this underdog who is is figuring this whole thing out with God and trying to figure out how do I navigate this judgment and, and all of this stuff. And we put ourselves in the place of Habakkuk. It's what we naturally do as we read literature. If you read any fiction literature, you place yourself in the person of the hero. We can't help it. You are not the hero. We are sinful Israel. We are the ones that Habakkuk goes to God and says, don't you see? Do you see the injustice in us? NCC, do we see the sin in us? Are we so blind to it? Because it's become such a part of who we are that we just miss it. Are we no longer broken over it? And thus we are satisfied with lesser things. We value the created more than the creator. We value the healing more than the healer. And so we say, you know what? If my HVAC is working, there's food in the fridge, then God is God and God is good. If my 401k is on the up and up, I don't have too much debt, then God is God and God is good. If my kids are making good grades and they're doing well in the sports league, God is God and God is good. If I got into that college that I hoped I would, God is God and God is good. If I am happy and healthy, then God is God and God is good. Church, in all those things, make no mistake, God is God and God is good. But he is beyond good to us. Because even if all of those things are gone in a snap tomorrow, God is still God and God is still good. No matter what. So what does that mean? It means that even if the furnace quits working in the dead of winter, even if the stock market crashes, or even if your kid is failing biology and gets put on academic suspension, even if they get kicked off the team, or your third, fourth, fifth, sixth choice college says no, God is still God, and so God is still good. Even if you get the medical diagnosis you prayed you never would, God is still God and God is still good. Even if in your anxiety and depression, even if they are running through the roof, even if God doesn't come through in the way that you think he should, would, or could, even if, God is still God and God is still good, no matter what. I asked the band to put a song together for us this morning, and I just want you to listen to these lyrics. And then I'm going to come back in a moment, and we're going to take communion together. But as they sing, I want you to rest in that truth. That God is God, and God is good no matter what. Because remember where we started. We started in the storm. It is easy to say God is God and God is good when the days are sunny and when everything is going right. It is much harder when everything feels like it is falling apart. And so I don't know what you bring into the room this morning. Each of you carry something different. You each carry something unique. Storms that only you can face. And so I'd ask that as the team sings this song, would you take whatever that is and just place it at the feet of Jesus? You know what it is. It came to your mind as soon as I said it. You know the storm that you are walking through. Let's take those storms, take those hardships, and place them at the feet of a God who is God and a God who is good no matter what, even if. It doesn't go the way that we think it should.